Tonight, real quick, we're going to go through something. Like I said, I think tonight is going to be a really good connector to what um, Pastor Bryce is really going to be teaching about, which is prayer. Um, prayer, I think, is um, such a vital part. It's the essence. When the Word of God says pray without ceasing, that's just a, uh, a message to us that in all things we need to be praying about everything. Um, and we need to acknowledge God in everything that we do. Even when we messing up, even when we ain't doing it right, we got to acknowledge God because the word of God says that he'll give you a way of escape. So, so prayer is always going to be a part of who we are as a people. Tonight, what we're going to do, we're going to go to, um, we're going to go, if you got your Bible or your app, you want to go to the sixth chapter of Micah. Now, just a little bit of background about Micah. Micah is one of the minor prophets. Micah is one of those prophets. When people start hear about Micah, they, uh, he, he's one of those dudes that he, when Mike, Micah started talking, it's, depending on where you at, you might not receive it well. Because Micah's always got a, he's always got a word of correction. But how many of us know we always need a word of correction? Because we ain't got it figured out. And the minute we think we got it figured out, God going to show us, you ain't got it figured out, boo-boo. You ain't got it figured out. And so even, you know, and I say this is something I've said a lot. Um, when I was 16, I knew everything. When I was 26, you couldn't tell me. I didn't know everything. When I got 36, I started questioning what I knew about everything. When I got 46, I realized I ain't know nothing. And at 53 now, praise God. All right, Kevin Hart. <laughs> All right, Kevin Hart. I know what you wanted to say, though. <laughs> I'm going I'm 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 to go the way of Don Chill. I'm going ch to chill. I'm going to chill. But at 53, I'm a sponge. And what I mean by that is I'm very much a, a person in learning mode all the time. I don't care who it is. If it's somebody that's 20 years, yes, the uh, day before yesterday, I play golf with somebody. Chubby's what, about 30, 20 years, 25 years younger than me? Chubby's 30-something. So he's about 20 years younger than me. Listening to him. Getting some nuggets. People like Chris. Getting some nuggets. So it's not, we never, don't ever want to get to the point where we think we have arrived because God is always going to let us know you ain't got it. You ain't got to figure it's because there's always going to be another layer to something that we don't know because the word of God says what we know in part and we prophecy in part. So that means like what we know is like Dallas compared to the entire universe. Y'all get me? Dallas, you know everything about Dallas. But that's all you know compared to the entire universe. That's a whole nother topic for a whole nother time about us being in one place all of our lives. And, and because we know that place so well, we think we know life well. That's a whole nother topic for a whole nother time. But what hap what's going on in Micah, Micah's always a person. He comes, when Micah comes, Michael shows up, people are like, oh, here he comes. You know, it's, it's one of those things where you know, Micah's saying, don't kill the messenger. You know, I got a message. I got a message from God. And so in chapter 6, um, we're going to read about uh, what Micah was, where God, this is one of those times where God was like, yeah, y'all been tripping. Y'all been tripping, and I got a word for you. And, and it's not just going to be a word that's going to convict you, but it's going to be a word that's going to, give you a road map to get back right. Because any time that, you know, whether we believe it or not, 
Anytime we mess up, we want to figure out the way to get back to where we need to be, right? We always want to find that way to kind of get back on track. You know what I'm saying? And, and God, after the admonishment, after the discipline, he says, okay, here's the roadmap. And that's how we are as parents. You know what I'm saying? When you, we got kids, when they do something wrong, you discipline them. You tell them why you discipline them, and then you say what? Okay, this is what we need to do next time in that situation. And this is what God is going to do. Tim, I think you got the NIV pulled up, and I like the NIV. You know what? I'm going to read it from my phone because I think I want to read it. I'm not going to read it out of the uh, Passion Translation. I want to read it out of the NIV. I like the way it reads. We're going to go NIV, yeah. So let's go. All right. So we're going to read verses 1 through 8. This is what the Word of God says. Listen to what the Lord says. Stand up. Plead my case before the mountains. Let the hills hear what you have to say. Hear you, O mountains, the Lord accusation. Listen, you everlasting foundations of the earth, for the Lord has a case against his people. He is lodging a charge against Israel. My people, what have I done to you? How have I burdened you? Answer me. I brought you up out of Egypt and redeemed you from the land of slavery. I sent Moses to lead you, also Aaron and Miriam. My people remember what Balak, the king of Moab, Moab plotted and what Balaam, son of Behor, answered. Remember your journey from Shittim to Gilgal, that you may know the righteous acts of the Lord. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow down before the exalted God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with a thousand rams and with 10,000 rivers of olive oil? Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has shown you, O mortal. This is where we want to check up right here. He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God or with your Elohim. Eternal Father, in the name of Jesus, we come to you just thanking you for your word, Lord God. We thank you for us having an opportunity to break bread with you, Lord God. We pray that you would be in the midst of this Bible study tonight, Lord God. I decrease, Lord God. I decrease, my flesh decrease, so that you can increase and your spirit can increase in me, Lord God, to teach this word to us tonight, Lord God. Father, we sit before you, Lord God, as as Mary did before the feet of Jesus, Lord God, asking that you would just give us a word to touch our souls and our hearts, to change us and transform us, Lord God, so that we, on that day, will be able to hear from you, well done, thy good and faithful servant, enter into my rest. So, Father God, we just thank you for this word tonight. We thank you for the correction of your word, the convicting of your word, and also the encouragement. All these things we pray to you in the name of your son, Yahshua HaMashiach, we pray. Amen. Amen. So, so y'all see, um, the Lord brought a charge, and I wish if Pastor Omar could preach, I'm sure he could do the, this way more justice than I could, having a legal background. But it's basically, um, the Lord done indicted the people of Israel. Because they've been doing sin against him. They've been sinning. They've been sinning against him so much. And he brought this levy, this charge against him. And then at, once they levied the charge against him, they seen how upset that he was. Then they were like, what can we do? What can we do? Then they want to try to appease him with all these other things. They, you know, can we send him all this olive oil? Can I give you my firstborn? Can I give you all these things to make repentance or, or, or a restitution for the sin that I've committed. And we all get like that sometimes. We get to the point where we've done something or, or we, we've violated to such a degree where we show contrition. We show contrition to God. And, and we just get to the point where we're like, 
God, you know, I know I done made these. I know I personally I done made these promises. Father, if you get me out of this one, I promise I, I'm prob- I'm gonna serve you. I'm gonna do what I'm supposed to do. I, I, I'm telling you, I'm, I'm I promise you, Lord, if you get me out of it. As soon as he, because God's God's word, and His promise is not slack. So what God gonna do? He gonna get you up out of it. Then what you do? Show him your. Never mind, I ain't gonna say it that. But you know what I'm saying. You turn your backside to him. You go right back to what you was doing before. All of us have done it. All of us have done it. I know I have. You know, made all these promises and God you can do this and God do that. I promise I'm gonna do this. And and God gonna remind you. He gonna remind you the promise you made. The word of God says what though? He says, when you make a promise to God, do not delay in fulfilling it. Do not delay in fulfilling it. Because the one thing is God is paying attention to what you're doing. Because we think, you know, but he's always watching. We can get away with this, we can do that, and, and we can be okay. No, man. God is paying attention to everything that's doing. And why? It's the same thing with our parents. I'm telling y'all, I don't care. 3212 Rita Lane, Huntsville, Alabama, it's 1985. I'm telling y'all my age. I'm at the house. I walk in from football practice. My mama upstairs in her room. I walk over into the kitchen. She can't even hear me. Soon as I put my hand on the pot, my mama said, get, your, get out of my pots. Why? Because no matter when we think she ain't looking, she know. She ain't got to be seeing it, but she just know. Why? Because she knows me. She knows her son. If she heard me come in, she know I'm going straight to the kitchen. In the same way, God knows us. He knows what the propensity for us in our sins are. Your sins may not be my sins. Your issues may not be my issues, but he knows your issues. So he knows when you get close to something, that's when he's paying attention. He's really paying attention then. Because he's saying he's going to provide you a way of escape, but it's us to look for it. So tonight we're going to review three things. We're going to review, number one, as it says, it says the the first verse, uh, the first part of verse eight says, he has shown you, O mortal, what is good. O mortal. So we're going to talk about our mortality. Number two, he says he has shown us what is good. He said later on, he says, what does the Lord require of you? And three, we're going to talk about what he desires. So first, our mortality. Mortality is finite nature of our strength, our time on earth, and our resources. It says he has shown you, O mortal. Here God is reminding us of our mortality. We are finite beings with a limited strength, time, and resources. The one, the, something I heard a long, all my young life, especially when I used to go home to family reunions and stuff, and old people used to say, it, youth is what? Wasted on the young. Why? Because as young people, we feel like we got all the time in the world. We feel like we're immortal, invincible. You know, we have all the time in the world to do the right thing. And, and so we're, we're not as compelled to do the things that may cause us some discomfort or may not be popular or whatever it is in our youth. Because what we, what we have to understand, though, is this, is that first off, especially in our community, in the community of Hebrews, we know that as black men, if we make it to 25 or 35, in many cases, that's a whole victory right there, depending on where we come from. Because we know that black men, especially, die at higher rates than any other demographic in the entire country. So we don't have a whole bunch of time as men, as Hebrew men, to get the things of God done. Hebrew women. Y'all are sex trafficked more than any other group of women in the entire country. 
Y'all just don't end up on the little alerts. Y'all don't end up on the milk cartons. Y'all don't get national attention. But when Becky and such and such and all these other people get missing, everybody knows about it. And I'm saying that I'm being for real because we have to pay attention to the fact that we ain't got a whole bunch of time. There's a whole lot of forces that are coming against our people to keep us from waking each other up. So the time is now for us to go ahead and get locked in because this awakening is happening. You know, I was, um, um, this past weekend, uh, well, the weekend, was it the weekend before last? Or the past weekend? The past weekend. Man, we've been traveling too much. We were down in Lafayette, and I was talking to somebody, and we were talking about how when we were in high school, again, I'm about to tell y'all my age, there was a song by KRS-One. Y'all know, some of y'all know what song I'm talking about, right? Y'all know what song I'm talking about? Some of y'all do. Okay. It's a song that basically, he laid out the whole thing about us being Hebrews. And this song came out, again, in 1980-something. So... So the whole thing about it was, this is something that's been out for a while. The, Hebrew, the whole Hebrew-Israelite movement has been in America for a long time. It's just now it's starting to get traction. It's starting to be people like Stephen Darby, who I, who I consider to be the John of, not call, and I'm not calling Pastor Omar Jesus. I'm just saying that John prepared the way. For Pastor Omar, because if y'all know anything about most of us in here, we know who Pastor Darby is and we know how Pastor Darby used to teach. He taught hard. Pastor Omar don't teach like that. Pastor Omar is affable. He's funny. He's congenial, but he tells the truth. And he's going to give you both sides of it. He's going to give you the correction, the conviction, and he's going to give you the encouragement. All, all uh, Pastor Darwin was doing, all he was doing was throwing elbows. So, but, and what happened to Pastor Darby? He left us early. So again, that's reminding us of our mortality. We have to pay attention and be mindful that there's work for us to do, especially in this city. Y'all don't understand. Dallas is three hours from everywhere in this country. Y'all know that? By, by, by airplane, don't be looking at me like that, by airplane, by airplane. Dallas is three hours from everywhere in this country except Alaska, and it's five and a half hours. And I say that because of this. This is a central part of the country. There's coming a time, again, and I'm not sitting here talking about prophetic stuff. Me and my wife have actually talked about this. Dallas is going to be a hub. Y'all watch. Dallas is going to be a hub where people are going to be coming here to find out what's going on with Hebrew people. And we gotta be ready. But being ready is understanding that you don't have a whole bunch of time to be trying to figure out a whole bunch of other stuff. Let, just go ahead and say, Lord, whatever your business is, I'm willing to do it. And I'm telling you, without any contradiction in my heart, I'm telling you, your life is gonna change. You're gonna be in some uncomfortable places, but the Lord gonna bless you. You're going to be in some uncomfortable situations, but the Lord is going to bless you. Because the thing is, he said, he said he, when he adds blessings to you, he has what to it? No what to it? No sorrow to it. Because the only sorrow that, that we're going to experience is the stuff that comes from the outside. Because you're going to be persecuted. You're going to be talked about. You're going to be maligned, even amongst your friends, your family. I mean, we got friends that, you know, we used to kick it with, have a good time with. Date night with the Paulies. Ain't that right? Folks used to call us weeks in advance to be wanting to hang out with the Paulies. As soon as, and I mean as soon as, we decided to do the work of God, do the work of Yahweh, them same friends that used to kick it with us, that used to go everywhere with us, used to want to travel with us and all that kind of stuff, you don't see them here. But again, I'm telling you, God is separating the wheat from the tares. He's separating the wheat from the tares. So think it not strange when your family and your friends think you crazy because you're talking about that Hebrew stuff. It's okay. 
Because at some point, you're going to be the one that's going to tell them. I had to tell my mother. We were the Hebrews. She still chewing on it. We told her father. He hit one of his questions with me was he would say, son, how come ain't no church ever preached out of Deuteronomy 28 before? Because they can't answer the questions. They don't know how to answer the questions. They're not humble enough to answer the questions because it takes a lot of humility to answer those questions in Deuteronomy 28. Why? Because now you got to ask, well, why have I been preached this for so long? And they ain't ready to answer them questions. And this, this is not me maligning any pastors in the mainstream church at all. I'm not maligning them at all. I'm just saying that this is a time now where those of us that are willing to come to places like this because of we understand who we are, it's time for us to do the work. We can't sit on our thumbs and, and let our fruit rot on the vine, like I said to y'all a couple weeks ago. We can't do that. It's time for us now to go off and start doing the work of the kingdom while we have a chance to do it. Because, I got, you know, I'm going to move on to the next point. Oh, it's, I'm, I'm going to Psalms 90 and 12. You got that, Tim? Psalms 90 and 12 says to teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Recognizing our mortality helps us focus on what truly matters, making the most of our time by aligning our will with God's will. I'm going to share something with you. One of my favorite scriptures in the entire Bible, Psalms 37 and 4. It is such a cool scripture. It says, you don't have to pull it up, Tim. It says, delight thyself in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Now, I'm going to tell you, when I first heard that scripture, I wasn't real mature in the word. All I heard was, delight myself in the Lord. He's going to give me the desires of my heart. I knew what my desires was. Money, I want a nice car, I want a nice house, I want to get married, have a beautiful wife, all that kind of good stuff. But guess what? He didn't give me those things then. When I understood delight thyself in the Lord means to delight in the things that the Lord delights in. When the light came on with that, then when I started doing the work of God, then when I humbled myself before God, then when I start getting uncomfortable for God, being OK with with sharing my faith with people about the Lord Jesus Christ, then. Then I went from being homeless, being evicted, to finding my wife, to, to moving into a, a three-story townhouse, to moving in a 3,000 square foot house, to buying my wife a, a, a Mercedes, to having a pay for, and I'm not saying all this stuff to brag. I'm just saying all the stuff I asked for, and let me say first the beautiful wife part, but I'm just saying that all the stuff I asked for, God gave me when I submitted my will to his will. So all the stuff that we want, we got to say, God, okay, I do want that stuff. You know my heart. I want that stuff. But I want it because you want me to have it. Because God's not going to give you something you can't manage. The only reason God gave me a wife is because I know how to manage a wife. The only reason God gave me what he's given me is because I know how to manage it. Do you know how to manage your life? I didn't. That's why I went through all the trouble I went through in my life. I'm, 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 I ain't quite dumb as a box of rocks, but I'm okay. I own my own business before I moved to Dallas. I owned two mortgage companies. 2008 took me out of there. Anybody know about 2008, the mortgage crisis, all that kind of stuff? Maybe y'all too young. I'm dating myself again. See, that's what I'm saying. I'm, I'm dating myself again. I went from a thriving mortgage business to almost filing bankruptcy. Foreclosing on two house, short sale two, and sold one. 
own five houses. Moved to, moved to Dallas. Credit score went from 780 to 515. We black, we know about bad credit. Only until I submitted my will to God and said, God, whatever you want me to do. She's over there, she'll tell you. I ain't lying. All, I'm, I'm, I'm going to share something with you. My wife took care of most of our wedding because of where I was. Now that's why I don't have a problem taking care of my wife's needs. My wife, somebody ran into the back of my wife's car, totaled it. Not a problem. She said, baby, I don't need a car. My wife's so humble. Once y'all get to know her, she's real humble. She, I'm simple, babe. I'm simple. I don't need nothing. Let me take that Mercedes back, though. See what happens. But no, it's not that she wanted it, because I picked it out. But I'm saying that to you all because of this. Everything that you desire in your life, God wants you to have it. But the caveat is the but. You got to submit your will to his will. Because your will, what is your will going to get you? What is, it, what is doing it your way gotten you to thus far? Has it gotten you what you wanted? I'm telling y'all a better way. And I'm telling y'all because I'm standing here as a living witness to it. I'm not telling y'all something I don't practice. I pray every morning. I study every morning. I spend time with God every morning. You know, my, when, my, when my daughter comes on the house, she be tiptoeing out of the house so she don't disturb me because I'm spending that time. But I even want her to see that because it, 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 it takes that. Because sometimes we see, we, we want to emulate the result and not the process. But we got to emulate the process. And God has given us the process. He said, he said also in uh, verse 6, he said, what is good? He said, what this good the Lord has shown us. And Romans uh, 12 and 2 tells us this. He says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your what? I can't hear y'all. Renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve God's will, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. What I have in my notes, and I'm using Pastor Omar and, and Pastor Bryce, God's good is not hidden. God is not hiding, because sometimes for us, it's like, God, where you at? You know, you see I'm going through. Where you at? But God's goodness, he doesn't hide it from us. It's really in plain sight. It's revealed through his word and through Jesus Christ, who modeled the ultimate good in his life. So for us to experience God's best, we have to emulate. Remember I told you, we want to emulate the result, but not the process. We got to emulate the process. And how do you know what the process is? Go back and read what Jesus did. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Are you re to really get an understanding of who God is? Because God gave us an understanding of who he, who he is in the person of Christ. And so if you want to understand who God is and understand how to get in his will, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. If those will save you. I mean, for real, for real saved. I would implore anybody, if, you, if you're like I was at, at, at many times in my life, even growing up in church, shaky in your faith, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Read them. Know who Christ is. Because when you know who Christ is, you're going to know the character and the mind of God. Reading those four books. Lastly, this is what the Lord requires. See, I told y'all, God's going to admonish us. He's going to encourage us, and he's also going to convict us. 
Pastor Omar said that this weekend. What happens in the church all the time is that pe- pastors want to encourage you, wait on the Lord. He's coming. You just wait on him. He's going to give you all that you, he, he wants good for you and not evil. We want to hear all of those wonderful flowery messages to make us feel good about ourselves. But what about saying, you, you screwing the pooch? You messing it up? We don't want to hear those messages. It's counterintuitive to us being human beings and not to want to be corrected. But who are we to say, God, nah, you got it wrong. I got, I got it right. You got it wrong. Because understand, God's about, just like the, the enemy sends people in your life to distract you, things in your life to distract you, God's going to send people in your life to hold you accountable and correct you and make sure you understand what the path is. Your job is to do what? Discern one from the other. David, when, when um, no, Solomon, excuse me, Solomon, when he was praying, remember, one of the most famous prayers, what, what did Solomon do? He didn't pray for riches. He didn't pray for, pray for gold and silver. He, played, he said, Lord, Give me your knowledge, your wisdom and understanding to govern your people and give me the, the ability to discern good from evil. Pray that prayer so that when people come into your sphere, you automatically know what they're all about. Because, I, and I've said this to y'all before, I pray that God show everybody that's in my circle my heart. God show them my heart. Because God is a God of reciprocity. And if you know what reciprocity is, that means if I ask God to show them my heart, God's going to show me their heart. Then you know what you need to do. Because as the great prophet Maya Angelou said, when people show you who they are, you got one job. And what's that one job? Believe them. So, so if you ask for the discernment, God's going to give you the discernment of who, who's for you and who's against you. You know what I'm saying? So it says, what does the Lord require of you to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your Elohim or your God? To do what is right, act justly. Justice is a recurring theme in the Bible. Isaiah 117, Tim. Isaiah 117 says, It says, learn to do right, speak justice, defend the oppressed, and take up the cause of the fatherless and plead the case of the widow. That means that our job is to make sure we're being just. Being just. Woe, the word of God says, woe unto them to call Good, evil, and evil, good. Um, in Proverbs, it talks about do not uh, remove the boundary of the poor person. He said, well, God will pick up and plead their case for them. So our job is always going to be about making sure that less fortunate people than us are taken care of. Because what happens? Because guess what? To, to you, to somebody else, you're less fortunate. So guess what they're going to do to you? Somebody's going to help you out and you helping somebody else out. So we're we're always because we're all under God. So we're all there's always levels to this thing. So there's always going to be somebody that has more resources than us, has more ability than us, has more things that they can do to help us. But our job is to whatever station we're in, help those that are under you, because somebody else that's higher than you going to see you and is going to help you out. But be prepared for it. I tell my son and my daughter all the time, write the vision. If you got a vision, write it down. Because when you're in a state where you're helping other people, because what, we want, what do we want to know when we're helping other people that are less fortunate than us? What do you need? What can I help you with? So when somebody comes to you and says, Chris, what can I help you with? I got this business, dog. Here. I done, read, I done wrote it all down. Don't I mess with you about that, Tika? All the time. Write it down. 
sneaker queen right there. Know every sneaker in the whole book. Y'all pray for me as I pray for her. She start her business so y'all can get shoes. But you write the vision. So when somebody sees you less for man, I see Chris struggling all the time. Man, Chris out here working, doing his thing, man. Chris, man, God told me to bless you, man. You got a vision or something you want to do? Yeah, dog. Come on. Hold on a second. Let me get my notebook. I got this business I've been writing out. Okay. Because Habakkuk 2 2 said what? Write the vision. Make it plain on tablets. Though the vision may tear, it may not tear. It will come to pass. It, but you write it down so what? He who sees it may run. And what that means is when you write the vision down, it may not be you. It may be somebody like Nick that got that $50 million we were talking about earlier. As soon as he sees it, say, bro, I got it. Hey, Chris, I know who to talk to. Come on, just follow me. I got the money. We're going to go and get it done. He who sees it may run. But if you ain't got, if, he, if somebody come to Chris and say, Chris, God told me to bless you. What you got? I don't know. I don't know what I want to do. I don't know. I'm just, I'm just working, dog. What I'm saying is, have a vision so when somebody comes to do something just for you because you're doing justly to somebody else, be prepared. Because people that are really less fortunate, we, we kind of know what they need. They need day-to-day -day stuff. When they come to Chris, Chris already got the day-to-day -day stuff. What can I help you with, Chris? I got this business. So be ready. Be prepared for that stuff. First of all, do stuff for other people. Act justly to others, but also acting justly means living with integrity and fairness in all of our dealings. Whew. Integrity and fairness in all of our dealings. Yeah, they gave you $3 back when they was only supposed to give you a dollar and 50 cent back. No matter of fact, that 10, that 20 was actually supposed to be a 10. Go ahead and get back. No, that was not a blessing. That was a mistake. That may cost somebody their job. No, don't don't get it twisted. I, you know, and I ain't fronting because I remember I remember riding with my I remember riding with my grandmother. Now my grandmother was the one. She was the saint. She was the non cusser. I remember she was going to get a pack of them, a carton of them Pall Malls. Yeah, no filter, like them Chesterfields. Y'all too young. Y'all too young. Y'all know nothing about that. She got a carton, and the lady gave her back. She gave the lady a 20, and the lady gave her back. I'll never forget this, $32 back in change. My grandmother drove off and said, praise the Lord. <laughs> she took me to McDonald's, right? I'm happy, but as a kid, something about, something about that wasn't right. And, not, and, and, and I'm not going to stand here before you like I'm some Satan. I've always done that. I've been the one. That Jordan is going to be short tonight. You know, but, but God's watching. And, and, and it's, it's, it's acting justly means living with integrity and fairness in all of our dealing. You know when you're getting over on somebody. Dog, I ain't going to even do it to you. Because guess what? That which you sow, so shall you reap. You finesse somebody out of something. Guess what's going to happen? You're going to get finessed. And don't think you can't get finessed. Because hey, cause it's always somebody out there that's slicker than you. You think you're slick as a can of oil, but it's going to be somebody that's slicker. Trust and believe. Trust and believe. Love mercy. Mercy is at the heart of God's character. The only reason that we are able to breathe in Yahweh, the only reason we're able to say his name every time we breathe, the only reason we're able to say these aspirated consonants of 
Yavvev, Havvev. I'm almost done, baby. I'm, I promise you I'm almost done. The only reason we're able to say, breathe, Yavvev, Havvev, Yahweh, is because he's merciful. Because of his son, who he died on the cross for our sins, past, present, and future, That's what he's all about, mercy. Matthew 5 and 7. Tim, blessed are the merciful, for they shall be shown mercy. This is something I say to me and my wife talk about a lot, especially with us professional Christians. Us, and especially us Hebrews. When it comes to David... Bathsheba, Uriah, Abraham lying on Sarah, Noah drinking, all these other people in the Bible that done all this crazy stuff and sin and all that kind of stuff. We got so much grace and mercy for them. Oh, they're the patriarchs. Well, let Pookie or Ray Ray do something wrong. You're going to tear them all the way down. Because I, this is what I say all the time. I say, the one thing that Christians are not good at is having grace and mercy in real time. We're not good at it in real time. But that scripture, put it back up, Tim. It said, put it back up, Tim. It said, blessed are the merciful, for they shall be shown mercy. In the hood, we say, well, I'm going to let them what? I'm going to let them make it. I'm going to let them make it. Guess what? Somebody going to let you make it too. Because you ain't going to be perfect. You're going to mess up at some point. I don't care if it's cutting somebody off or, or getting in somebody. Y'all know I-20, cut somebody off. C cut the wrong person off on I-20. You might get some uh, bullets in the side of your car. So us letting other folks make it is only putting a deposit in the bank for somebody to let us make it. Because loving mercy, uh, loving mercy means extending grace and compassion to others just as God has extended it to us. Grace and mercy. We, we gonna, I'm telling you, I don't care who you are and what kind of relationship you are. My wife and I, I mess it up all the time. She messes it up. But there's grace there. We got to have grace with each other. And that's the only way we're going to be able to receive that same kind of grace. Because, because go, go stand before a holy God and you've been getting mercy shown all your life and you ain't extending no mercy to nobody. Like I said before, depart from me. That's a harsh thing to say for God to say. Depart from me. You worker of iniquity, I never, past tense, knew you. So even when you said you was lifting up holy hands and you was EKOC, should have bought a Honda and all that stuff. God said he didn't know you. He didn't know you. Because you were a person that received mercy, but you never extended it. So we always want to make sure. We're, um, we're doing the right thing with that. The last one says, um, walking or live humbly with your Elohim, with your God. Walking humbly with God means acknowledging his sovereignty and our dependence on him. Tim, put uh, James 4.10 up, one of my favorite scriptures in the whole Bible. Like I said, as a new Christian, this was one of my go-to scriptures. Humble yourselves. Therefore, I like when it says therefore, that's in the King James Version. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. I like the way it says in the King James Version, so I'm going to quote it. Humble yourselves. Let me get my Charleston Heston voice up. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me get my Charleston Heston voice. Humble yourselves. Therefore, under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. 
That's what the word says. Humble yourself. To humble yourself means that it's not weakness. Humble yourself means strength and power under control. That's what humble is. The fruits of the spirit. I got $5 for somebody who can name them all right now. $5. We need, that's what we're going to study next. Love, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and the last one, which activates all of them, self-control. That's what humility is. Humble yourself, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may do what? Take all of the strength, all of that will, all of that knowledge, wisdom, and understanding you got, and he will exalt it when? In due time. Not yet. Remember what I said earlier. Not yet because you don't know how to manage it. Not yet because your heart ain't right. Not yet because you got the wrong people around you. In due time. So that means you got to, all of those little scenarios I just talked about, you got to monitor that stuff. You got to check up in those areas of your life. Because God wants you to prosper. As your soul prospers, the word says. But if the word of God says for you not to cast your pearls before swine, you think God going to do it? You think God going to do it? You think God going to give you everything you ask for and only to, to be like the prodigal son? Remember what the father did? The father gave him everything that he was entitled to. And what did he do? He said he went and spent it on what? Riders living. Y'all know what he did with it. He was over in Atlanta at the city. At the flame. Y'all know where he was. Y'all know where he was. But then it said what though? When he was in there eating with the pigs, eating the slop. I love this part. He says what? And he came to himself. He said, I would rather even be a servant in my daddy's house. And he said, what did he do? He humbled himself. Went back to his father. What did his father do? He took the ring off and gave him the ring and gave him a new coat and said, hey, we're going to have a party. My son back. He's going to give you everything you want. Because see, remember, he gave him everything that he was entitled to. But what did that, what did you just say? The daddy gave him more. He had a whole lot more. So you think you're doing good. You got a decent car. You living in a decent spot. You, you driving. I mean, you wearing decent clothes and stuff. You got a pretty decent job. But you know that's not the end. That's not God's best. If it's not his best, why not want God's best? But want, want God's best is going to cost you. It's going to cost you being uncomfortable. It's going to cost you the things that, that you find comfort in. Because just like I asked y'all a couple weeks ago, does your faith, does it make you comfortable or does it challenge you? The only comfort you should have in your faith is that you're going to heaven if you believe, truly believe, if your heart statement, your heart statement, remember I said, what are you going to say to God when you stand before him and he says to you, Chris, Nick, Rodney, Tara, Takitha, I ain't going to call out everybody's name tonight. Why should I let you into my heaven? And it, remember, he ain't listening to your lips when you go to heaven, so you can't slick him. You can't, you can't be all buttery with the tongue and, and get in. He's not listening to your lips. He's listening to your heart. Because the word of God says, well, out of the abundance of a man, heart, his mouth speaks. That's what's going to speak before God. Before you even open your lips, God's going to know if you really form or not. Because unless you can say, I shouldn't be here, I shouldn't be here. If it was not for the cross of Calvary, I shouldn't be here. It's about daily intimate fellowship with our creator. This is what walking with um, your God is. A daily intimate, intimate.
We grown in here for the most part. We got a baby in here, so I ain't going to be too explicit. Intimate. Daily intimate fellowship. Do you have daily intimate fellowship with the Most High? Have you went before him before and been in prayer and something and maybe even been quiet where God brought something into your spirit and you immediately start praising and crying? And that's intimacy. I've heard it said intimacy is into me. You see. Do you really let God see into you? Do you have intimate fellowship with him daily? That's what walking with your Elohim is. It's recognizing that without him, we're nothing. That's what walking with the Elohim is. Walking with God is. Walking with Yahweh is. Recognizing that without him, we don't even exist. Like I said earlier, every time we breathe in and breathe out, we're saying the name Yahweh. Aspirated constant. Constant. We're saying his name all the time. So let us understand that. Sis, you can go and tell me. To understand that daily it's about intimate fellowship with our creator. To go back to review. At verse 8, Micah 8, it says, He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God? So tonight, we talked about our mortality and how we don't have a whole lot of time to get this thing all the way right. We ain't got a whole lot of time to think um, we got tomorrow. Marvin Winans, I think it was sang a wonderful song about tomorrow. But the word of God says tomorrow has its own troubles. It also says don't brag or boast about what you're going to do tomorrow because it has its own troubles. So you need to be worried about what's happening right now because the word says what? Today is the day of salvation. Heaven forbid You were to leave out of here tonight and something was to happen to you. And you're either in two places. You haven't truly made Christ the Lord of your life. You say he is Lord. It's just like me living or being from France and saying Joe Biden is the president. He is the president. But I'm from France. He's not my president. In the same way, you can say Jesus is Lord, but is he your Lord? Does he have the throne of your heart? Because again, I don't want any of you to have to stand before God tonight or any other day into our future and not have the right heart statement before a holy God. So in a nutshell, Micah 6 and 8 tells us to live a life that reflects God's character, acting justly, loving mercy, and walking humbly with him. It is a simple yet profound it's simple and yet profound and as we embrace these principles we try we can find we can find we should find we hope to find true humility and peace there's there's as i was saying before we have to make sure The word of God says about making our election sure. And how 
you make your election sure is Romans 10, 9 and 10 says, if we confess with our mouth and believe with our heart and y'all know the rest. So there should first be an admission that you're a, a sinner. And as the scripture says, you're and you need an Elohim, you need a savior and his son, Jesus Christ. Because in and of yourself, you have no righteousness. Said the word of God says that our righteousness before God is like filthy rags. And if you ever tried to clean a dish with a dirty rag, you know what I'm talking about. I don't care what you do with a dirty rag. It ain't whatever you're trying to clean. It ain't going to never come clean. And everything, if we're born in sin and shaped in iniquity, that means that everything we, we pick up and hold is dirty. The only thing that we can own that's not dirty is Christ. And so today, if, if you're not sure, I'm going to ask everybody to stand up. We're going to go and get out of here. But if you're not sure that you've truly given the throne of your heart, like if you are an HR manager and you have an open position for Lord, if you're not sure that you fill that position with Yeshua HaMashiach, we're going to pray tonight. We're going to pray tonight that you give him that position, that when you give him that position, just like any Lord, any president, any person that's over an organization or over a, um, a government, you're going to come under authority of that Lord. And you're going to allow him to lead, direct, and guide your life. And the other thing is, maybe you kind of got off the rails a little bit. You start, you know, kind of had a little success. Had some things happen where, you know, life is good. But trust it can be better. You know, I, I think I've, even through my own example, I've shown y'all that the life that you have now is nothing. Nothing compared to the glory that God wants you to have in him. And he's going to give you everything that you want, but he's going to give it to you the way he wants you to have it. So you may be in a situation where you kind of, Gave God the Heisman a little bit. Well, yeah, you know he exists and, and you know you have some love for him. But you haven't made him your Lord. You haven't given the throne of your heart. You haven't humbly come up under his hand so that he can lead you, direct you, and guide you. That may be you. So tonight we're going we gonna to take care of that too. Because we want you to be restored into intimate relationship with your Elohim, with your God. So part of it may be like, how do I start living this good life? What does God require? It all begins with a relationship of Yahweh through Jesus Christ. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to go and pray. You know, you want me to, she's singing that song back there. As, as all heads bowed and all eyes closed. Heavenly Father, we come before you acknowledging our mortality and our need for your guidance. Thank you for showing us what is good through your word and through your son, Jesus Christ. We confess our sins, our many sins and our shortcomings. And we ask for your forgiveness. Help us to act justly, to love mercy and to walk humbly with you every day. Father, some of us need to invite Jesus into our life. So tonight, Father, we, we invite Jesus into our hearts as our Lord and as our Savior. Father, some of us need to write that relationship. So, Father, tonight we ask that you restore us to a right relationship with you, Yahweh. 
Father, the one thing we thank you for, because you're so good at it, we thank you for your grace and your mercy. And it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Y'all be blessed tonight. Love y'all. Huh? Why? Okay, so, so, move this way. Well, well y'all hear Ms. Dawn. Ms. Dawn say all of us to move over to this side of the room. I do not know what's going on, so we're just going to go ahead and pray, Father, in the name of Jesus, Father. We just thank you for your provision and for your protection, Father, for your people, Lord God. Father, we thank you for whatever's going on outside, Lord God. We pray that no lives are lost, no people are hurt. Father, and that whatever situation is going on, Lord God, we pray that you bring peace to it, Father. So, Father God, we just thank you tonight, Lord God, that we have watchmen and watch women, Father, that are watching over your people, Lord God. For every situation and circumstance, Father, you've given an answer, Lord God. And I pray that your answer goes forth tonight and again in that situation and in that circumstance. I pray that you allow all of us that are in this place to make it home safely to our destinations tonight with any, without any hurt harm or danger, Lord God. Father, these are the moments, Father, where we count on you, Lord God, where you show up and you show out, Lord God, and that you remind us that you are our Elohim and that you desire to have a relationship with us because you're always going before us, making our path straight, leading us and guiding us, Lord God, and putting up a, a shield of faith before us, Lord God, that we may be protected from the fiery darts of the evil one. So we just thank you tonight. And we praise you. We glorify and magnify your holy and righteous name, Yahweh. You are our strength. You are our redeemer. We love you. We say thank you. For even this moment of protection, we say thank you. For even for this moment of us not walking into something that we don't know what's happening, we say thank you. We say thank you for armed security, Lord God. We say thank you for Sister Tara packing her pistol tonight just in case it gets sideways. Father, we thank you for, it's a couple pistols in here. and We thank you for, for we say praise to God and pass the ammo. We just thank you, Lord God, for again, for us being mindful of our safety, Lord God. And we just thank you for everything that you're doing in our lives. And it's again, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. May the Lord bless you. May he keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you and give you peace. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah.